Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to uh, For Your Consideration Daily. My name is John Campia. I'm going to be your host for For Your Consideration Daily. Now, normally, I am joined by a co-host, but unfortunately, I kind of forgot to get my uh, ducks in a row today, so I didn't arrange for a co-host today. My bad. So it's just going to be me and you guys, just me and you sitting here talking about movies. Uh, for those of you who don't know, For Your Consideration uh, is a, a podcast that we do, and FYC Daily is a daily morning live streaming uh, version of For Your Consideration. Now, uh, you know, For Your Consideration is done uh, with me by guys like Steve Weintraub of uh, Collider and Dennis Zen of, of uh, uh, Think Hero, Jennings Roth Cornette, and, and many others. Uh, but it's difficult sometimes for us to get all of our schedules together, and so that's why I decided, you know what, we're just going to do a smaller version of For Your Consideration. We'll do it every day, every morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's Los Angeles time or 1 o'clock New York time, and call it FYC Daily. So that's what we're doing here. We started it last week, and we are here right now. You're going to be able to, by the way, now get this uh, some house cleaning out of the way. If you want to subscribe to this show, you can do it through my YouTube channel. Uh, so you can hop onto my YouTube channel and subscribe to the show that way. But if you want to subscribe to the show in a more traditional way, you can go to iTunes and search for For Your Consideration, and you'll find our podcast there. You can subscribe to the video podcast. We'll, we'll also have links floating around where you can subscribe to an audio-only podcast. If you go to my um, hobby movie website called moviereviewstogo.com, that's moviereviewstogo.com, you'll be able to find the uh, everyday show up there as well with links to download the audio only version and also links to subscribe to the audio only version or download the video version, whatever you'd like to do, lots of options. So by the way guys, if you want to chat with us, uh, and by us today, I guess I just mean me. Uh, you can just jump into the chat board. So if you're at on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash FYC podcast, which by the way, you should like our Facebook page. So it's at FYC podcast, facebook.com slash FYC podcast. And you click on the Ustream live link in the sidebar. There's a chat board in there. You can jump in there and chat with us live. And I'm going to be taking questions and taking your feedback. And as a matter of fact, since I don't have a co-host today, I'm really going to need your help <laughs> to, uh, to keep us going here. So I'm thinking this might be a little bit of a shorter installment uh, of the show. I'm going to start with, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't, just, just for a minute, bear with me, guys. If you're not a football fan, just bear with me here for a second. A uh, bunch of friends over yesterday watched the Super Bowl. I, I am neither a uh, New England Patriot fan, but I'm really not a New York Giant fan. I hate the New York Giants. Um, so none of my top three or four favorite teams are in the Super Bowl, so I found myself rooting for the New England Patriots. And it was, um, it was a painful game to watch. I mean, the difference in that game, here's what it really came down to. The, the Patriots had the game locked up. There's four minutes left in the game. They have a two-point lead, and they have the ball. Uh, and I, if they weren't already in New York Giant territory, they were close. But um, <laughs> a pass gets thrown to Wes Welker, who is one of the most sure-handed receivers in the history of the NFL. And granted, it wasn't the, the pass. Brady didn't put the pass right on the money, but it was in his hands. It was in Welker's hands. It would have been a first down. The Giants had either no timeouts left or one timeout left. They would have been deep in New York territory. That's it. Game over. Wes Welker drops the ball. And ultimately, the Patriots have to punt it away. And then another situation arises. The Patriots or the uh, Giants have the ball now. And Eli Manning throws up not a great pass to the sideline. A 30-yard deep pass right along the sideline. And his receiver, I can't remember if it was Hakeem Nix or Manningham or Cruz, but made this ridiculously acrobatic catch and ridiculously was able to keep his feet in bounds. So the difference in this ball game was Wes Welker dropped the pass that would have ended the game. Manningham or Cruz or whoever it was caught the pass. It was Manningham, I believe. Uh, Audrey H. is saying it was Manningham. Um, Manningham caught a ridiculously not great pass. And it drives me crazy that, you know, at the end of the game, people are saying, Eli Manning did it. Eli Manning did nothing. Eli Manning did nothing. His receiver made a ridiculously acrobatic catch just like the last Super Bowl they won. They had no business winning that game. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm exaggerating. It's not that they had no business winning that game, but that game was over. The Patriots had won that game. But Welker dropped the ball, Manningham caught the ball. And that's the difference. That's the difference. 
Two big plays in the last four minutes. One would have sealed the game. One, and the other one would have sealed the game too if Manningham didn't make that ridiculously incredible catch. But anyway, um, that's uh, that's that's uh, all I have to say on the Super Bowl. I'm not going to waste too much time uh, on the Super Bowl. But uh, let's get into talking about some movie stuff. Uh, this this past weekend, a couple of movies came out. Uh, one of which I really really liked. One of which I really really didn't like whatsoever. And you guys know that, um, if you've been following me at all, the Daniel Radcliffe horror film that came out this week, uh, this past week, The Woman in Black, is a ridiculously bad, horrible, horrible movie. A terrible, terrible movie. A horror film that is neither scary nor has any other redeeming qualities about it. It's just bad. It's just a terrible film. And Chronicle came out, which I was super pumped about. But Chronicle, I, I really enjoyed Chronicle. I gave it an 8 out of 10. And I believe Rotten Tomatoes right now has it at 85%, which I was surprised at. I, I thought I'd be the only one that liked that movie, but I'm really grateful to see a lot of people did, but I still didn't think it would do very well at the box office. But at the box office this weekend, if we look at these numbers here, it kicked butt. I mean, it actually, well, I mean, it didn't dominate, but it did much better than I thought it would. Chronicle comes in first place at the box office this weekend. First place, uh, taking in... Uh, what do we got here? $22 million at the box office. The Woman in Black comes in second at 21. Uh, Big Miracle is the third film that came out, a very nice little film with John Krasinski and Drew Barrymore. Takes in $8.5 million. Uh, like I said, it's a nice, nice little film. Um, the Gray comes in third, gr a really solid film that I'll never watch again because it stressed the hell out of me at $9.5 million. But the, the big surprise here is that Chronicle came in first. I don't think I think even the people who loved this film and really were excited about it, I don't think any of us dreamed it would actually come in first. We thought the the Harry Potter film, The Woman in Black, would uh, would definitely win the box office, and it did not. Now, uh, Chronicle made I think that had to have exceeded expectations at twenty two million dollars. The Woman in Black, I think, was probably right around where they thought it would be at twenty one. I think it was, they were expecting twenty five, so it's really close. Big miracle. Underworld Awakening continues to underperform. Uh, One for the Money also underperformed. Red Tails, Disappointment. Uh, the Descendants continues to make a little bit of money on its Oscar buzz and stuff like that. Uh, Man on a Ledge, which is a really nice little film, a really nice little heist film that I think didn't get the credit it deserved. It didn't get the audience it deserved. Uh, and then Extreme Without Incredibly Close, uh, rounding out the top 10. So me personally, I, I got to tell you, I was thrilled. That Chronicle ended up taking the uh, the number one spot at the box office uh, this weekend. It's a great film. It's a solid film. It's exciting. The best found footage movie I've ever seen. Um, and yeah. Anyway, uh, A Pod Rocks uh, writes in the chat board. Uh, Big Miracle will make the money from the rentals. It just screams rental. And, and that's true. Like these nice little what you could consider family films. Uh, you really do. Um, see them do well at, at home video rentals and on home on video on demand and stuff like that. So you'll probably see it do pretty well on that. Uh, and I can't expect that it costs that much money um, to uh, to actually produce the film. So so there you go. That's that's the the roundup of the weekend box office. Thrilled to see Chronicle do so well. I mean, if you haven't seen Chronicle yet. I think some people are turned off, and it's unfortunate that this is the case. I think some people are turned off by the fact that um, there's no big name stars in the film, and there aren't. There aren't any big name stars in the movie, and that's uh, you know that's a fair thing to say about it. But this film didn't need stars. I think this film would have been hurt by big name or recognizable actors in it because it's supposed to feel so real. The key to Chronicle is how real it feels. And when you got a film that feels that real and it draws you and it sucks you in, then the fantastic and unimaginable things that happen in the film are that more impactful and have that more, more of an impact on you and your viewing ex experience. So I, and the cast is fantastic. The cast makes you believe it. And that's one of the challenges. I said this in my review. When you have a movie that's supposed to be found footage, and it's supposed to convince you as an audience member that what you're looking at is real. This is really from a home video camera you're seeing. Then it really puts a heavy, heavy burden on the performances in the film to convince you and keep up that facade that what you're looking at is real. And that is a difficult, difficult task. But I'm telling you, this cast, 
Alex, uh, Dane DeHaan, Michael B. Jordan, the three main guys in the film, do such an incredible job, especially Dane DeHaan. Um, just remarkable performance. Uh, I mean, it's not going to happen, but I'm telling you, I, I don't mean to be facetious here. I'm being dead serious. I won't be shocked, and I will make a case 10 months from now, uh, nine months from now, 10 months from now, that Dane DeHaan should get consideration for an Academy Award. I mean, his performance is that good. It just sold me. I completely bought into it. Um, Old English is asking me, how were the effects in the film? The effects were incredible. The effects in Chronicle were incredible. Um, once again, getting back to this whole thing about what you're seeing is supposed to be real. When you're doing a found footage movie that is supposed to be convincing your head and your mind that what you're seeing is real, it makes video visual effects even more difficult because look, when you're watching Lord of the Rings or you're watching Star Wars or you're watching Avatar, your brain knows that you're looking at a fantasy world. And so uh, things that are outside of your experience, visual effects of an alien monster, well, you've got no point of reference for that alien monster. You've got no point of reference for that huge battle combat spaceship in Star Wars. You just don't. And so it, the visual effects almost benefit from the fact that your head has no point of reference for it so you can just accept what you're seeing when you're doing visual effects that are supposed to look real and it's supposed to jive with your brain that what you're seeing is real found footage from a real home video camera it puts a heavier burden on the effects to really pass themselves off as real and i'm telling you there were a couple of moments in this film that they didn't do me and oddly enough the moments, the visual effects moments in this film that didn't quite convince me were some of the simpler visual effects. Uh, there's a scene where Dane DeHaan is juggling and using his telekinetic powers to juggle. And that didn't look so real, so that pulled me out of it a little bit. But then some of the grander visual effects in the film, you know, that one visual effect in the trailer where Daniel DeHaan is sitting there looking at the camera all angry and serious and he's sitting down cross-legged in front of a wrecked car and he just puts his hand out like this crushes his hand and you see the car crumbling behind him, crushing as if it's if there's a giant invisible hand on it crushing the car. That's got to look real. And when, I mean, when it comes to the larger scale visual effects, it, it my brain bought into it. And so I was so very impressed um, for, for, for what I saw there. And I, I cannot wait. I really hope they do a sequel. I really hope they do a sequel. And it looks like this movie is, is making... Um, is making money. It looks like it's going to make profit. And so with, with that being said, man, I really hope they do another Chronicle. And once again, uh, not to belabor the point, but Woman in Black is such an awful, awful movie. It's such an awful movie. And, you know, I'm one of these guys where I completely believe in the subjectivity of film. I preach the subjectivity of film. So if somebody really likes a horrible movie, I'm not going to say, well, you don't know what you're talking about because film is art and it all strikes us differently. So, you know, I anticipate people, there are people who will like movies I don't like. I anticipate there are people who will not like movies that I do like. And hey, it's all great. That's all good. I got to tell you, man, this woman in black, I don't get it. I don't, the woman in black has a positive rating on Rotten Tomatoes right now. Which means I think it's about 60% of the critics are giving it a favorable rating. And I don't get it. And I tweeted out to my peers. I put out a tweet to my peers saying, For those of you, my friends, who are giving this movie a positive review, you've got to explain it to me. Because I, I just don't see it. I don't get it. This is a terrible, terrible film. Again, all film is subjective. And if you enjoyed it, more power to you. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed your theater-going experience. I'm just saying to me, from my set, point of view, where I was sitting... Just a god-awful movie. Terrible movie. So if you haven't seen Chronicle yet, you haven't seen a movie this weekend yet, and you're trying to decide between, say, Chronicle or Woman in Black, go see Chronicle. I will say this for Woman in Black, and I put this in my review of it. Uh, one of the things I was afraid of for Woman in Black was that Daniel Radcliffe would come on screen, and all we would see was Harry Potter. I was nervous that Daniel Radcliffe would come on screen, and just our eyes would just see Harry Potter. And that's it. Just Harry Potter. And I'm going to tell you, Ratcliffe is legit. Um, he convinced me, or at least um, you know his performance, I think I saw Harry Potter for the first minute that he's on screen. And then it was gone. Then it was just, 
him as his character. And I think that's a huge testament to his performance, and I think that bodes very well for his future as an actor. I think he can break out of the Harry Potter stereotype. I think he can break out of it. Um, we're going to have to see him obviously do more than just one film here with Woman in Black, but I hope he gets a chance to do more. I'm sure he will get a chance to do more, and I think he's going to prove that he is legit, that he can hang uh, in there and not just be Harry Potter anymore. It's, it's going to be exciting to see, much like, you know, his, his career could go one of two ways. Daniel Radcliffe could either be Mark Hamill from Star Wars, where he has this huge, iconic role and was never able to be anything else other than that. Or he could be Harrison Ford, who was also in the huge, iconic role Star Wars playing Han Solo, but was able to then move forward from that and his career could be more than Han Solo. And his career is even more than just Indiana Jones. I mean, Harrison Ford has a decorated, illustrious resume when it comes to the films he's done and uh, i think he's gonna be great so give me one second to take a sip here uh anyway so let's uh let's talk about this super bowl was yesterday and one of the things that everybody talks about super bowl and is excited about super bowl for of course is the trailers and the, you know the movie commercial but mostly commercials in general but for us film fans, one of the big things we're really excited about, of course, is the movie commercials. And there were a number of really high quality, highly anticipated film trailers that came out. And I got to tell you, one or two really blew my socks off. Uh, one or two did nothing to change my opinion. And the most of them just kind of disappointed me. I, I, For the most part, I was disappointed. Now, um, to me, by far and away, the uh, the best movie trailer commercial... Uh, was um, uh, Avengers. Avengers, to me, was the big one. It was the best one. Now, it, uh, for a couple reasons. One, it finally showed us a little bit more than what we've seen from the trailers so far for the Avengers. And it's crazy to think, but we are actually getting closer to the Avengers than I like to imagine. The big thing for me about this new Avengers trailer was that we see more Hulk. We finally really see the Hulk. There was a previous installment of um, this trailer uh, of the Avengers that really only gave us a quick glimpse of the Hulk. But this trailer, especially the extended version, we didn't see the full version uh, on the um, on the Super Bowl, but look it up online. You can find the full extended version of the Super Bowl trailer for the Avengers. It was awesome. It was awesome. It blows my socks off. And there's for those of you who haven't seen it, there's this great and old English is kind of quoting it in the uh, in the uh, in the chat board right now. But one of my favorite parts is near the end of the trailer. You see Tony Stark and Loki standing face to face. Tony Stark's pouring himself a drink and talking to him, and they're having this quick conversation. And Loki's saying, "I have an army," and <laughs> Tony Stark says. Yeah, but we have a Hulk. And then it cuts to the scene of the Hulk just jumping through the air, smashing ships as they're flying across the sky. It was awesome. It was really, really great. Now, obviously, I've, I've had my engine revving for, um, for Avengers for a while now. I'm excited to see the Avengers, obviously. But I'm telling you, the, uh, the one I'm really wanting to see, it, it has souped up my anticipation level for uh, for the Avengers so much. I so bought into it. It, it was incredible. Now, one of the other trailers uh, that, of course, showed during the, uh, during the Super Bowl was Battleship. I, I, I just, I don't know how a movie like this gets greenlit. I, I just don't, I don't know. This, and I don't know how you can make a movie look even worse than just the idea seems. These trailers for Battleship, I'm telling you, have been terrible. And the um, the uh, Super Bowl commercial, the Super Bowl version of this uh, trailer has done nothing to improve um, its standing with me at all. Uh, as you can see, I'm playing these trailers on Hulu. But to me, these just look awful. And, you know, I, I'm never, I don't like non-actors getting big roles. So them having Rihanna in this movie is just is a red flag to me. Look, I love Rihanna, but... Having her in this movie is just a big, giant red flag to me that uh, these filmmakers aren't serious. They're not serious about making a good movie. 
They're just trying to capitalize on the name recognition of the name Battleship and then throwing in a name recognition like Rihanna. And did it bother any of the rest of you that they the trailers just give away this total spoiler that Liam Neeson dies and probably dies pretty early in the film. Like, you got an actor like Liam Neeson. The one legit credible thing this movie had going for it was uh, Liam Neeson's in it. That gives this film at least a monochrom of credibility. But then in the trailer itself, they give away, they, they just give away the fact that Liam Neeson dies. Because they say in the trailer, um, where's the captain? The captain's dead, sir. You're in charge now. Oh, okay, so I guess Liam Neeson's dead. Thanks for the spoiler. Thanks for giving that away. Thanks for telling me in advance that the one modestly credible thing that your movie had going for it, you take out of the movie probably pretty early on. And I don't know, maybe Neeson, maybe Neeson knew that this, uh, this movie was doomed to fail from the beginning and said, okay, I'll do it, but I'm only sticking around on set for a week. So whatever you can squeeze me into a week, that's all I'll do. I don't know that that's the case. I'm speculating. But uh, to me, this, this movie looks just, just terrible. Just absolutely terrible. Um, there were a couple other trailers that uh, of note that came out. There's The Dictator, which which has potential. But the thing about The Dictator was, if you're going to do a big Super Bowl splash, so do like The Avengers and show us something significant that we haven't seen before. And The Dictator trailer was really just, other than his introduction saying, Hey America, I just bought NBC. Um, I already know the final score of the game. The suit Talking about the Super Bowl. Other than that little intro, there's nothing in this trailer that we haven't seen in other trailers. So I, I didn't really get um, why they did that. One of the other ones, and put this under also me being hugely disappointed, is the trailer for G.I. Joe. Now, one of the big problems for me, first of all, conceptually with G.I. Joe, and we'll get to this trailer in a second, is that it looks like they do what the Transformers did. Now at OfficeDepot.com. Um, the Transformers, uh, remember the old animated film, the old Transformers animated movie? The big problem with that old Transformers animated movie, of course, was the fact that within the first five minutes of the Transformers animated movie, they took all the Transformers that I already knew, that I already loved, that I had already, as a kid, had emotional attachments to, and in the first five minutes of the Transformers animated film, they killed off all of them. They killed them all, except for, I think, Bumblebee, uh, what might have been the only survivor. I'm not, Bumblebee, maybe Jazz. Did Jazz survive? I think maybe Jazz survived. They killed them all off. And the rest of the, and all that film became was a marketing tool to say, look, kids, we need you to buy new toys. So all these toys, all these Transformers you love so much, we're just going to kill them off. So therefore, don't worry about these ones anymore. Now we have a new batch of toys for you. Screw the old ones, go up and buy the new ones. And that was a disaster, the worst thing they ever did. And, and you know, they later admitted that was the worst possible move we could have ever done. And like two years later, they brought Optimus Prime back to life. Anyway, the reason G.I. Joe reminds me of that is, of course, you know, it, it looks like they do the same pattern right at the beginning. From the trailer, it looks like they're just killing off all the people from the first film. Everyone who's in the first film, if you like the first film at all, which I wasn't a huge fan of the first one, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. We're just going to kill them all off. They're all gone. No more Channing Tatum. Uh, no, not a, no more Scarlet. No more any of the other characters that you might have liked. They're all gone. They're all gone. They're all gone. So we're just going to start this again. And so it's... It's why don't you just call it a reboot? I mean, I appreciate, I love The Rock, I do, but if you're just recreating the franchise again, just do us the favor and just say you're restarting the franchise. Don't pull this bull of killing everybody off in the first five minutes because what that does is it completely throws away the first movie. What you're telling me now is the first movie has no value. Them, their escapes, their battles, them cheating death in the first movie. It was all irrelevant because they're just going to die in the first five minutes of the next movie anyway. Kind of reminds me of like the uh, the old uh, Loose Gossett Jr. film, Iron Eagle, and then Iron Eagle 2. You know, wh why have this kid's heroic journey in Iron Eagle if you're just going to kill him in the first two minutes of the next movie? 
it, it's it's annoying to me. I don't mind main characters dying off, but don't do this wholesale sweep of oh, just everybody's dead, and now let's move on to new sets of characters. Yay! It's it's just a, uh, it's just stupid. Uh, Audrey is saying the first GI Joe movie had no value in the first. Now uh, Snake Eyes apparently comes back, and um, of course the uh, Storm Shadow comes back. But I mean, I don't know how you bring Storm Shadow back because, man, I mean, I'm glad they're bringing Storm Shadow back. But man, they killed Storm Shadow. I mean, they killed Snor Storm Shadow. He was dead. They they didn't leave a lot of room, wiggle room there for Storm Shadow maybe surviving to come back. They they just killed him. And but I guess they realized they really need him back for the next one. So away he comes for the next one. Uh, there were a couple of other ones at uh, the played in the Super Bowl. I thought the Hunger Games one was okay. I wasn't really huge on the Hunger Games one. I, I, I am excited about the Hunger Games. I'm very um, interested in seeing it. But, uh, you know, at the same time, it didn't really do it for me. John Carter of Mars is one that is um, tearing me apart a little bit. I I got to tell you right now, I'm, I'm not liking what I'm seeing so far. I'm going to give this movie a sh its fair shake, though. Uh, because it's, you know, Disney's behind it. Um, I didn't think the help looked all that good, and it ended up, to me, being the best film of the year. Um, I'm not going to underestimate Disney and the films that they put out. I'm just saying, from what I'm seeing from the marketing from John Carter of Mars, it's not looking good. It's a bad sign when you're watching a trailer for John Carter of Mars, and for the first 30 seconds, you don't realize you're looking at a trailer. Because when I first saw the first trailer for John Carter of Mars, what I saw, or what I thought I was seeing, was a fake trailer for maybe a self, a new cell phone, or a fake trailer for a new car commercial, or a fake something or other, because it looked so bad to me. I mean, these aliens don't look good the, in both levels. The design doesn't look good, and the execution of the visual effects on them doesn't look good. Granted, I haven't watched it on the big screen yet, so I'm saying things don't look good. But that doesn't mean it can't be awesome. Maybe it will be awesome. I, I'm, I'm going to reserve judgment, obviously, until I see it. But I'm just not all that impressed. So going down what I was looking at before, I, I think the the good trailers were, were films like Lorax, I think, had a good trailer. Uh, John Carter of Mars, not so much. Hunger Games, not so much. Um, obviously, a, a G.I. Joe, I don't think it looks good at all. Uh, the Dictator, this one could be funny, but I wasn't impressed by the by the Super Bowl effort. Battleship, I think it's just going to be terrible and bad. Uh, the Avengers is looks fantastic. Um, and then there's this one, Act of Valor, which felt odd to be a Super Bowl commercial. That one could be really interesting because they use a lot of real uh, U.S. military guys in it. So that could be very, very interesting. So... Holding out hope for that one. Hey, listen, guys, uh, in a minute here, I'm just going to talk about the films that are going to be opening up this weekend. But do me a favor if you're in the chat board, uh, start putting in some questions that you'd like me to address or some topics you'd like me to address so I can, uh, I'll get to those in just a second. But go ahead and start typing them into the chat board. Uh, I'm glad you guys are here and doing that already. So, yeah, just go ahead. Um, True Hyena saying, so from the extended Avengers trailer, what was jumping out of the dropship? That's a great question. I don't know. I don't know uh, about that. It's it's just one of those things which uh, could be really interesting. Um, Buzzman actually just asked another question. I'll get to that in just a second. For now, let me bring this up. We're going to talk just for a minute about the films that are opening up this week. Um, the first one I'm going to mention here is uh, the new Channing Tatum film with Rachel McAdams, who's a good Canadian girl, um, The Vow. Obviously, this is, I mean, I think it's from the same people who did um, all the other heart string movies, so I'm not real keen on this, but I will say this. Speaking about G.I. Joe, I've hated Channing Tatum for a long time. I think he's just, uh, I, I, my thinking has been that he's just a scar and a stain uh, on the film industry. He had absolutely no talent, no acting chops whatsoever. Uh, G.I. Joe kind of reinforced that. That movie he did, I think it was two or three years ago, uh, Fighting. Man, that movie was awful. And he was the main reason it was terrible because he had absolutely no acting chops. That being said, I didn't think he was all that bad with his small role in The Dilemma last year. Um, 
I thought he was, I thought, well, hey, maybe comedy is his thing. Maybe he should be looking at comedy. And then without getting into review, because there's an embargo on the full review, but I watched an advanced screening of 21 Jump Street that he does with uh, uh, Jonah Hill. Could end up being the best comedy of the year. I love 21 Jump Street. I think it's awesome. I cannot wait for you guys to see it. I, I think a lot of you are just going to love this movie. It the, As a comedy, it's great. And I'm thinking Channing Tatum really has found his niche. He has found his groove. And I think Channing Tatum's groove is comedy. He cannot act dramatically. He just can't. We'll see what he does with the vow. Um, I'm not looking forward to it because I don't think Channing can do any good in, in drama. So it's not really my type of movie to start with. Added to that, the fact that it's Channing Tatum... But I'm telling you, give him a shot with 21 Jump Street. Give Channing Tatum a shot with 21 Jump Street because I really do think he just may have found his his groove with comedy. And he's he's really good at it. One of the other films that's opening up this weekend is uh, Journey to the Mysterious Island. Somebody somewhere said, you know what movie really deserves a sequel? Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yeah! And let's not bring back any of the characters from that movie. Is this a theme with The Rock? First with G.I. Joe, let's not bring any of the original cast back, just put in The Rock. And now they're doing it with Journey to the Center of Earth. Ah, who cares about any of the original cast? So let's just call it a sequel and just replace them all with The Rock. Seems to be their plan. Uh, this movie looks awful. The visual effects look terrible. This, the, the, the story itself looks awful. I'm not, I don't hold out much hope for uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Uh, maybe you are. Let me know if this is one that you're actually looking forward to. Uh, the last one that uh, is open, that one could talk about just for a second here, that's opening up this week, is the new Denzel Washington, uh, Ryan Reynolds flick, Safe House. I think this looks really interesting. I mean, I love Denzel Washington. I think he's great. I think Denzel Washington basically can do no wrong. I think he's one of the top 10 actors of our generation. Um, and he just brings this awesome screen presence. And I think, look, you can't watch Buried and tell me with a straight face that Ryan Reynolds doesn't have serious, serious acting chops. doesn't matter if you liked uh, Green Lantern or not. Ryan Reynolds has serious acting chops. All you got to do is C9, just see Buried. See a lot of the other films he's done. He's got serious acting chops. I am extremely excited to see him acting alongside a guy like Denzel Washington. I, I think the premise is good as a you know as an action thriller. I think this is a great genre for putting the two of them together. I'm excited for it. So, if one was going to ask me, uh, in which order am I looking really looking forward to uh, films this year? At this point, I'm going to say. Number one is going to be Safe House is the one I'm most looking forward to and probably the only one I'm actually really looking forward to at all. Uh, then if I had to go see Journey 2, I may go see that and the one I'd probably avoid is The Vow, but that's just uh, that's just my take on things. Anyway, that'll do it for me for now, for my stuff. Right now, I'm just going to spend the next uh, few minutes taking questions from you guys in the chat board. Uh, so let's start with that. Let me look down here at the chat board. This is one of the bad things about me not having a co-host today is that I got to try to talk and look at the chat board at the same time. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Miyiro, I don't know how to pronounce your name, dude, is saying Ryan Reynolds was great in Smoking Aces. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, he was actually really, really uh, solid in Smoking Aces. I think he did a great job. Um, and uh, just one of those films. But it wasn't a great film. So it, it's it's one of those things where... Um, even though he was great in it, he's not really going to get the credit for it because it wasn't a great movie. So people aren't going to... Usually when you get a film that's not so good, people don't pay attention to or notice great performances within a mediocre movie. So people don't talk about it. Ryan Reynolds was great in Smoking Aces, but because Smoking Aces wasn't that great of a film, not a lot of people talking about it. Uh, Old English is saying, Denzel is great but he's not picked a great movie or been in one for a while, unless I'm missing something. I think you are missing something. I think you're missing Unstoppable. The film uh, Denzel Washington did with Chris Pine last year, the one about the train. Look, I was as skeptical as anybody uh, about Unstoppable. I mean, it's a movie about a train. So, I mean, what's the big, a couple guys on a runaway train. What, you're, you can't make an exciting, intense movie based on that premise alone, I was wrong. They did. Uh, I, I thought it was fantastic. And 
Um, you know, somehow, some way, they found a way to make being on a speeding train on a track exciting. And I was uh, really impressed with it. That's one of the few movies that I actually rented at home afterwards. I don't rent a lot of movies because, you know, I see them in theater. And if I really like it, I see it in theater multiple times. Unstoppable, I saw in theater a couple of times. And I actually rented it uh, not too long ago to watch it again. So, yeah, that's one I would mark up for uh, Denzel Washington. Um, J Jacek is also saying, it really had to eat my words with Unstoppable. You and me both. I mean, I didn't think it looked any good. But, but going back to John Carter of Mars, right? That's what I was just saying. You can have a movie that doesn't look very good. John Carter of Mars looks like crap. Let's just put it out there. It does. I think it looks like crap. But... I would have told you almost the same thing about Unstoppable before I saw it. I thought it looked... Pff, okay, it's basically Die Hard on a train? Or it's Speed. That was what it was. I said it's Keanu Reeves. It's Speed, except it's on a train instead of a bus. Only it's more limited. I mean, so th what, what can be exciting about this? And yet I really had to eat my words. Uh, and it turned out to be really, really good. Um, Crockpot asks... John, you talked about the importance... Oh, wait, man, I lost here. Oh, there it is. John, you talked about the importance of antagonists, how important antagonists are in movies. But what makes a good antagonist? You know, that's a, that's a billion-dollar question. I don't have a real solid... I, it's one of those things where it's intangible. It, there are intangibles. But I think there are a couple of qualities that you need to have an antagonist. One, it has to be somebody, whereas much as you'd hate to run into them if they were real life, you actually enjoy watching them on screen. A great example of this is really uh, Alan Rickman uh, as Hans Gruber in Die Hard. Um, he, he's horrible. He's terrible. You'd never want to run into this guy. But when you're an audience member watching him, you want him on screen because he's so menacing and yet kind of funny at the same time there's a i almost find like some of the really great antagonists like maybe darth vader aside will also have a, a small hint of levity to them i i think maybe sometimes like for a great example too is alan rickman in robin hood man alan rickman is like the ultimate movie antagonist now that i think about it. i'm gonna have to write an article about that i think alan rickman the best movie antagonist ever but anyway so you go from die hard into robin hood one of the things that made the sheriff of nottingham alan rickman and robin hood so damn good was that he was so funny you know he comes across the two girls you my room eight o'clock you eight thirty and bring a friend. I mean, you know, you, you got lines like that. So they're menacing, they're evil, they're, they're, they're charismatic. But then again, you get some great antagonists that are quiet and solemn. I mean, you got Darth Maul, the, the, the best thing about the Phantom Menace. So, I mean, it's, it's such, there, I don't think there's a formula to a great antagonist. I think there's less formula to a great antagonist than there is to a protagonist. There, there are some standard Hollywood formulas for a good protagonist. But for an, a really good, memorable antagonist, it's difficult. One of my favorite antagonists in any film of the past, you know, 10 years maybe, um, was in Serenity. And for, you'll have to forgive me, the actor's name, he was in Red Belt as well. Um, the actor's name is eluding me right now. But the guy who plays the agent for the government in Serenity, um, who, you know, paralyzes guys and makes them fall on their own swords. If you guys remember the actor's name, please throw it up in the uh, chat board. Uh, I mean, that was a terrific antagonist. He was so eloquent and smooth and, um, and charming, almost a good guy in many ways, but he was not a good guy. You know, even the character himself said he's destined for hell, but it, it was so, so cool. I, I love that character so much. Um, uh, Lossri, L-O-S, C-R-I is saying in the chat board that Ralph Fiennes plays good villains too. He does. But Ralph Fiennes is one of those actors where he just does everything well. Ralph Fiennes does everything right. He can play antagonist, protagonist, comedy, drama, romantic, um, I mean, dramatic. It doesn't matter. He's just completely awesome. Uh, so, I mean, I, I absolutely love um, Fiennes. Actually, both Fiennes brothers, I think, are really, really gr great. Um, listen, folks, I actually got to cut it off right there. We're at 40 minutes, um, which means uh, this file size is going to get pretty big, and I have a file size limit for what I can put up for the show. So thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget, join me again tomorrow, 10 a.m. I'm going to have my co-host uh, co with me tomorrow, I absolutely promise. 
Um, so make sure you join me tomorrow, please, 10 a.m. Make sure you spread the word about the show. Once I post it up, please share it. Share it on your Facebook pages. Share it on your blog. Share it around. Tweet it for me. That would be awesome. Uh, don't forget, you can find this show a little bit later today. I'll put this episode up on my site at www.moviereviews2go.com. And within that post, you will have links where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes. You can subscribe to the audio-only version. Also, make sure you come back to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash podcast. I'll put up the show here. Make sure you like our podcast. And guys, email me. Email me at campia, that's C-A-M-P-E-A, at gmail.com. Give me your thoughts about this show and what you'd like to see us do, how you think it's going, where you think we can improve, what things you think we're doing well. I'd really appreciate your feedback. So once again, guys, thanks again for joining me. Don't forget to join me again tomorrow, same time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate you guys being here. And until then, bye-bye.